Right, just to explain uh, this uh, next session, do you want to come and sit here? Um, <laughs> Uh, just to explain the next session, the idea was to chew the fat and talk about some of the things you've heard about um, this, this morning. Um, just by way of introduction, on my far left, though not politically, I don't know, um, is Iqbal um, Wahab, who's the founder of the Cinnamon Club and the roast um, chain of restaurants. And then uh, Sophie Trochel is to my uh, immediate left, who is the MD of Divine Chocolate, the Fair Trade. Um, chocolate brand, and then on my right is Christoph Bailing, the um, founder of um, Bailing, um, Christoph Bailing Design, which is a product design company. And all of these guys will tell you a bit more about um, their views on these things. Just, I suppose, to explain uh, where, why, I'm, why I'm here and where I come from uh, on this issue. Um, look, I, um, some may have heard me say this before, I believe it, when we look at entrepreneurship that we here in the UK have a British dream, if you like, that is every bit as strong and poignant as the American dream. It's just that we don't really talk about it. We don't really celebrate it. Um, we don't really promote it. It's not so much a part of our conversation as it is in the US, which is one of the reasons that I instigated the whole Small Business Saturday campaign, bringing that concept from the US to the UK, because I thought that was some uh, thing that we could do to fix that. I think from our perspective as policymakers, as politicians, I think that we um, have a duty, we've got a responsibility um, to uh, collectively provide a platform for people to achieve their dreams and aspirations to run their own businesses, because that isn't only good for them as individuals, but it's good for them uh, and their communities um, too. And I also think, to be honest, in this day and age, people are rather tired of being told how to do things, told how to run things, uh, uh, getting that kind of top-down view, whether it's in the US from Capitol Hill or here from Westminster, but they actually want to be empowered to be the masters of their own destiny, whether that's as community groups or as um, businesses. And so my interest in this really comes from the fact that I, I think we need to do as much as we can to empower all of you to do what you want to do. But beyond that, I think there's also a bigger economic issue. Um, Mary talked a lot about the values and in, you know, how do you um, juxtapose and, and deal with the values, but also the need to make money. And I think one of the things that we learned coming out of the difficult period that we're emerging from in 2008-9 was that the kind of, um, if you like, model we had, which was very fast buck, was very orientated, in some respects, purely towards um, increasing the bottom line, um, obviously caused our country a few problems, which ended up with a financial crash, which cost us about £1.3 trillion. Um, pounds. And it seems to me, it seems to us, that the, if you like, the business models, practices and behaviours, which are um, going to, which we would rather have, which are more long-term and sustainable, actually are not only good for the country, but are actually good for business too. So as Mary was saying, if you actually invest in your people and treat them properly, they're likely to be more productive. They're going to take less days off. Um, if you don't pay attention to the pressures and the impact that your business can have on the community it is doing its business in, and that can have profound consequences, not only for the environment in which the business is doing its business, Think of, say, BP in the US, but also for its reputation when there are big disasters. Um, and ultimately, I think probably to be competitive in this day and age, the key, if you're not going to compete on cost purely and go for a race to the bottom, say, in retail, as Mary was describing, is going to be through investment and innovation and doing things that other people aren't doing. That's our view, and I suppose in government, you, you've got different levers, both from a regulatory viewpoint, but how you spend money as to how you incentivize these things. But I think ultimately what we're looking at here, and I suppose what this discussion is all about, is how can we actually create businesses that deliver shared value? So don't only deliver for the bottom line in terms of making money, but actually at the same time um, deliver for the community as well. How do you make good business good business? And it's on that note that I'm going to pass over to Christoph to see what he thinks about that question. Well, I mean, the, the good news is, I'm, I'm not English, I think I came to the UK in 97, 
And uh, the good news is that for me, it's not the equivalent of the high street. For me, I chose London because I think it's an amazing creative hub. It has all this kind of networking opportunities. It has this kind of multicultural, global connections at the same time being small enough that you can capitalize on it, uh, which for me makes it nearly the perfect creative environment. The bad news is that I never had an English client because the manufacturing in this country is so dire and the kind of project projects I'm, I'm into uh, could never be made here and there were no partners. So to talk a little bit where I started. The first thing, when I started in 97, uh, I started a company called Solar Lab. Um, I was rather naive. I just came back from Japan working in consultancy doing cheap consumer goods and I got a little bit frustrated because I felt like I was just basically paid to pimp up stuff so it sells more. So I thought that can't be it. So I thought, okay, I'm good at pimping things up, but I don't believe in what I'm selling in the end of the day. And 97 was sort of in Germany, uh, when I, st yeah, no, I think 96, there were solar cells. At that time, solar cells were on roofs, and they sort of were definitely talking like Ma Mary, they were not sexy. And I thought, well, what could you do to tell everybody that solar is fantastic? It not only works, but it's also wonderful. And I thought, well, if you put it on the top of the roof, you wouldn't even know it. So maybe on a boat, that would be great because you could see there is no cable going to it. There's a nuclear power plant. That would be the perfect example to do it. I've never designed a boat. I had no connection to boats, but I thought it would be a great idea. Um, and design <coughs> boats which are so beautiful that even if you don't believe, and again, 97 was a different environment, you don't believe in global warming, you don't believe in any of that, you're so seduced by it that you said, oh God, I want that. I don't want to get out, I want to get out of my speedboat and I want to get onto that one. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, it's, it's a very good, responsible, sustainable, it's a very bad business. Uh, <laughs> it's very, and, but it worked. And I think it was more, but it was never really intended to be a business. It was very much sort of to create objects which communicate not only a kind of positive, sustainable future, which is not about less, which is actually about more. Um, and it was not, yeah. And this is a boat which is running on the Serpentine since um, six years now. I've been trying to get it on the Serpentine for six years, arguing with the Royal Parks. Now it's sort of one of these entities. It's very well known. Eurostar put it on the kind of cover of all their kind of tickets for two years as an icon of London because I felt that was the kind of object which most represented environmental modern London. This object, this whole project, cost 220,000 pounds. It's still on the lake. It's still creating healthy revenue. I mean, the Serpentine didn't need a ferry. Let's be clear about that one. But the Serpent, I think the UK needed a sustainable icon which sort of say, this works. This is exciting. This is exciting stuff, and this can take us somewhere. Um, this is the biggest solar ferry we built in Hamburg. It's for 120 passengers, uh, running since 10 years very well. This is a project which I, again, royally failed. I was, my dream was to have 10 big shuttles on the Thames. Again, they, they would have made a fantastic impact, I think. They would have worked. They would have done a perfect service. The service, you know, the not, it's not only the fuel, but it's only the surfacing. So if you do the numbers, they totally work. Again, I'm a designer, I'm a terrible salesman, which meant that some of it I didn't have the kind of uh, long enough breath to see some of these through. But it's still, unfortunately, not in London uh, happening, but we're now doing a big project in Seoul, we're doing some project in China. It is something which is picking up, but I haven't been very lucky in the UK. Um, as a designer, it is a tricky thing. In principle, we, are, we, we create, we make, we want to make new stuff. We are, and now we're facing this dilemma that we've sort of been told that we all have to do less. It's a little bit like getting some uh, crack dealer to run a rehab program. We are not trained to reduce. We sort of trained to make no sexier, better, more wonderful. We are trained that you throw what you have into the bin and buy the stuff which I do. And that's a dilemma because I think how do you, apart from my profession, but how do we deal as humans that who always want more? And I think we have to accept this human condition. Unless, I think the only, I had a question, I had a discussion with somebody that recently, I said, did any entity ever motivate people to do less or use less? Mm -hmm. And he said, the only entity is uh, religion. So unless we all increase our religious, religious mm. 
entity, it's going to be very difficult to communicate to everybody out there to use less. But that's what our planet needs us to do. And since I talked about business today, I just want to talk about one little success story I'm in in into. And again, it's a bit surprising because it's not as obvious as it's all about. Ten years ago, I went to a company in Switzerland, Dark Hoyer. I said, oh my god, I'm into solar and I love what you're doing, but can we do solar, solar watches? I said, yeah, mm, okay, nice, maybe not. Anyhow, since then I work for them. We now design all their products and I actually learned that beyond my kind of young motivation, let's change the world, what they have is absolutely fantastic. If you look at the Swiss watch industry, it nearly disappeared in 1985. There was no reason for its existence anymore. Quartz watches appeared. The business was terrible. It was a fraction of what it is now. Yeah, automatic watches, why would anybody need them? Why should this industry should exist? But they are amazing products. They are automatically wound. They don't need a battery. Uh, yes, energy material, minimal. It's steel and a little bit of brass. That's it. Uh, and they're locally produced. What um, Mary was talking about earlier, it's basically produced in four villages, four villages since four generations. It's a business worth 20 billion US dollar per year exports, only exports. It's massive and it's wonderful. And I think anybody who is into industries and sort of trying to understand what is the impact for a local industry, go to Switzerland and see, see these towns and how healthy they are, how wonderful they are, how proud they are. Uh, it is uh, fantastic. And again, they are great products. They're not what you would put on a cover on an eco product thing, but try to beat a Swiss made watch. The way how it's made, it's manufactured in a solar powered factory. Uh, it can be recycled if you would ever need to. It will go up in value, not down in value. They're great products. But again, you could also say you don't really need to watch and it doesn't really help the planet to move forward. This is the thing after all these years what I come down to as a designer. I think my job is to create the very best with the very least. And we also do phones. We just launched last week a phone which now is a, it's a world premiere where the glass is actually a solar panel. So the phone before was a Swiss engineered phone and the power standby time was one month and now it's basically infinite. So in principle if you use this reasonable and you would leave it sort of, it actually charges at natural, at uh, artificial light too, you wouldn't need to charge it. Uh, this is my ultimate challenge, and then I'm nearly finished. As a designer and as a manufacturer, we utilize processes to create. So we build tools to make bend this chair tube to an assemble and do whatever. In the best case scenario, we then make it recyclable. So then we sort of take it apart and we can reuse 20% of it. Fine. Not sustainable. We're slightly reducing the damage. The interesting thing is that nature creates, but nature creates not a final product. Nature creates a process. So my little naive sketch here. There's a little tree, and the tree makes a flower, and the bee makes an apple, and the apple gets eaten by an animal. The apple, the, the animal shits it out. A new tree grows again, and here we go. It becomes more. It becomes better. Everybody is happy. I have not cracked this one, but I really, really want to create a process. One process which is not quite that way. It's sort of, and I think that's sort of where I think there's a great opportunity for the UK. The old school, don't build factories with tools and heavy and all of that. Don't use that. But I think now we're having the 3D printer rapid prototyping. It's a very different world, which I think its impact is not totally transparent yet. This doesn't really work. It's supposed to be a video. We designed a, a perfume bottle. Uh, go back. Normally, it's made out of nine components, which all need to be assembled because they're all machined and complicated. And we designed a perfume bottle, which basically works like the human heart. It comes off the printer like that. Inside you have uh, the liquid, it sprays, it basically works like a heart valve. Impossible to understand here, but it works. So there are opportunities, and I think there are opportunities to, okay, the UK might have made some big mistakes in the last mistake, the last 20 years to let go of manufacturing, but the new generation of manufacturing will be a different one. And again, if you combine that knowledge of opportunity with a trip to Switzerland to see the impact of what manufacturing and all these companies which work together, what beautiful environment it creates, I think we want to something. So I hope that soon there will be a UK client on my list.
Christoph, thank you very much. Now, Sophie, um, one thing I was going to ask, um, just picking up on what uh, Mary was saying about consumers, um, not only buying into the value in a monetary sense, but actually beyond that. Um, how, I mean, do, with your brand of chocolates, fair trade, people think immediately of values. To what extent do you think that gives you a competitive advantage? To what extent do, do consumers come to you specifically because of that? I think you have to get the product right. I mean, so I think the product has to be good and that you want to eat it again. But I think it gives us um, a competitive advantage in terms of where we... Wh when we launched Divine uh, 14 years ago, we were um, coming into a market which was dominated by giants. So we're talking about coming into the UK chocolate market, which is worth £3.9 billion, which is 80% owned by three huge corp world corporations. Mm. And so that sense of, you know, they're spending six to eight million pounds a year above the line on advertising to keep a Mars bar or a Kit Kat bar in the place it is. How are we going to do anything with the scale of uh, resources that we have? Well, it gave us a fantastic story. It gave us a story that people were interested in, that journalists wanted to talk about, that people wanted to know more about, and that would give you a reason to be loyal to a product. And so that sort of sense of where people are creating brands and they're inventing the lifestyle around the brand and what this means, we're not having to do that because we have the, the real reason to be, which is our mission, which is to improve the livelihoods of the cocoa farmers that own the chocolate company. So they own 45% of the, of the chocolate company, which means they get 45% of the profits. But it also means that everything we do is about how can we improve their livelihood. We can obviously only do that by running a profitable company. It doesn't work otherwise. But it does mean that we're looking at the world from a different way because we're looking at the world from the way of how can we use as much of the ingredients as possible and how can we pay properly for that ingredients and how can we work with those farmers in a way that that can benefit them. And in ter in, do you measure the awareness that your customers have of the, well, where the product has come from? How aware are they of the story? We or, try. We try. Or is it we, another, we, you know, well, we, we, we don't have enough ship. resources to do it in a in a in a big and meaningful way. Yeah. Um, I'm amazed at how much people don't know. I think that um, I, I sort of I I, I mean because in Britain we we have a we're the most successful fair trade territory in the world. The fair trade market was is worth 1.7 billion pounds in the UK and it grew at 16 percent. Of that, that now means that 12 percent of all chocolate in the UK is sold with the fair trade mark. And so, so, so where fair trade's got to is, is, is quite, quite interesting. And so that, that's partly been built up of uh, fair trade towns as a movement, and they're groups of people who've come together in civil society with possibly people in churches, possibly people in schools, possibly their local elector, uh, uh, elected ex yeah. people. And they've passed policies to try and create pull-through on fair trade products. And we've got something like 650 of them. And they've really been a helpful way to create pull for, for, for fair trade. But what's been amazing to me is I can go and speak to a fair trade town and I can speak to an event that's actually mobilised about fair trade and I can describe the chocolate company and say that the cocoa farmers in Ghana who are organised in a cooperative own 45% of this company. And even those people are going to me, God, I never knew that. And you're sort of thinking, what would I have needed to do to tell them that? And there is a sense that, it, I mean, so I'm quite interested in what you said at the beginning of actually the American dream of setting up a company is something that we have here, but we just don't say it. Mm. I'd actually say it isn't something we had here. I think it's something we need to have here, mm. but it's not something we have here. I think that when Divine started 14 years ago, we had two things going against us as a, as a company. One is that farmers were perceived as lips, rich, landowners who whinged, who got disproportionate amounts of the common agricultural policy mm -hmm. uh, subsidies, so that using the word farmers was very negative. And then the other thing was the idea of setting up a company that was owned by farmers as a way of helping them get themselves out of poverty was seen as completely foreign because we suspected ownership. We suspected the sorts of people who owned things. And so I do think that, that if we want to do this, we actually need to address the reality of where the mass of people in Britain are. Mm. And so I think it's very interesting, the idea of, do really 80% of graduates want to set up businesses when they leave to get them to, to set mm. up their own businesses? What does that really mean? Does it mean they don't want to work for big, boring companies or doing boring jobs, or do they actually want to set up businesses? Because that's high risk, it's innovative, it's really hard work. You're going to work for you know, 70, 80 hours a week in order to make your business work. And so it's interesting, do they really want to do that and do they understand what it means? Iqbal, 
do you think there is a British dream? Because ma- I'm deliberately asking you that question because in many respects your story um, before you started expanding politicians' waistlines in Cinnamon Club, your <laughs> life story. Don't done it well on you. <laughs> <laughs> but your story, some would argue, is the British dream encapsulated. Well, uh, it depends which part of the story um, we're talking about. And you mentioned two uh, quite uh, legitimate um, principled businesses. My first one was the complete opposite. At the age of 11, I set up a gang at a school in South London. Uh, we, we nicked porn magazines and sold them and... Um, <laughs> other stuff and sort of made a lot of money doing so. and um, I wasn't expecting you to say that. No, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I once said this, uh, um, BITC invited me to go and speak at school and, um, and three students did You that. didn't say this in front <laughs> of the group of kids. Power, power presentation. <laughs> and I said, holy crap, what am I going to say now? Because I'm going to say all that. And so I told them the story about how I set up the business and the BITC guy, no, Stephen's still here, he had his head in his hand for the whole time. <laughs> but yeah, th- this is how real lives are constructed. Um, and uh, the reason I tell you that is because the gang made a lot of money when I was 13. It was like 1974. I was buying suits from Selfridges at £100 a time. Um, it was a great, great business. One floor. None of us uh, went to any classes. None of us did any studies. We all spectacularly failed our O-levels. Um, and um, my parents, who were very liberal, they said, look, you let you do whatever you wanted, but um, why don't you give it a go? Why don't you retake? So I did, and then I went on to do edibles, got my degree at the LSE, and went on to do proper businesses. Um, and the reason I'm telling you all that is about what happened to the rest of that gang. And the answer is nothing happened to the rest of that gang, because they didn't have someone guiding them into something else. Um, three ended up in prison within a year, two died. Um, all uh, who, who didn't die are leading meaningless lives. Now, these are smart, smart kids. I, know, I knew them well, I knew them for six years. Um, so I always wondered. What would happen if they were given that little chat and that little nudge? And, um, and I saw the same um, in Bangladesh when uh, my parents um, used to talk about this term, first class first. And around the same time I was coming out of that gang, I, I said to my parents, what is this term first class first that you always use? And if you got the highest first in your A, uh, their equivalent A-levels, you got the one state scholarship to go and study at Hauke University. Both of my uh, parents got it in uh, consecutive years, so they met. Um, and, and I always ask them, what if you were ill that day of that exam? What happened uh, to the guy who came second? And the answer about the guy who came second was absolutely nothing happened to the guy who came second. Um, so I always had these thoughts in my mind that um, you know, it's, it's great that I've had the breaks that I have, but there's so many more people who've had that break if they were given that lucky chance, mm. that, that, that moment. And I thought, yeah, rather than just hope that people have that, I could actually trigger that in, in my businesses. So um, first at the Sydney Club and more recently at Roast, um, I've been working with a number of young people, um, a lot in prisons, more recently um, uh, with gang leaders. I brought a whole group of gang leaders into the Sydney Club the other day and um, scared the bejesus out of everyone. But um, <laughs> um, um, they, um, with, with a little help, with a little encouragement, with a little, like, uh, like gang leaders that have brilliant businesses, they, they, they run uh, fantastic uh, financial models, they could just be shifted to the other side of the road. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have got an entrepreneurial culture here. It's uh, largely in council estates in Peckham and those kind of places. It could be easily brought out of there mm. uh, if people who've run successful businesses then go on and extend that experience to others. And where it builds good business sense. And in those days, it didn't. People thought I was crazy doing mm. all those things. But now, I went, uh, last year, I went on um, Gordon Ramsay's program when he went into Brixton Prison. Um, and I took on a couple of the guys um, who were in prison. And, um, and the Evening Standard wrote an article about the fact that I'd taken on these guys. Mm. And, um, and this is an unintended consequence, but it's a real important consequence, especially in the context of what we're talking about here today. I got letters from people saying, I've never been to your restaurant, but now that I know you do things like that, I will. I'm coming. Right. Um, people say to me, I didn't know you had such a diverse workforce. I like that. I'm going to bring my office party here. Um, people say, wow, you've got three stars in the Sustainable Restaurant Association grades. That's the kind of thing that makes me go to a restaurant. So you do it by principle, but now, I mean, we, we hope this for five, six years ago, case. but now we've seen the commercial element to it. So you can't have a sustainable business, a principal business, and a financially responsible one, um, not despite those things, but because of those things. Mm. It's interesting, actually. I mean, as it happens, Brixton, I am Brixton Prisons MP. Um, and I didn't know that, which is fantastic. 
So you don't think there, there is this trade-off to be made? Well, in the old because days, Because often, I, I mean, when you talk about um, corporate social responsibility, for example, uh, before we got to where we are in the conversation now, it, it was always discussed as this kind of like add-on, you know, that big companies had as a PR vehicle. Whereas actually now, it is threaded more through the actual central mission, like I think it certainly is in your case, um, of the business. But is there a trade-off to be made? And like with your shareholders, for example, I don't know if you, 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 you're the only shareholder, but do you, do you feel there is that tension? Well, yes. Um, certainly, I had, um, I had loads of shareholders at the Cinnamon Club, and um, they used to moan at me all the time about the fluffy stuff that I was doing. Oh. And, um, and so um, I stopped talking about the fluffy stuff because um, I, I hid all that cost. That so you did it anyway? Some, yeah, I just put it in the marketing. <laughs> and um, then you know, they'd come to finance meetings and say, and I'd say, yeah, that's an industry standard norm for marketing in restaurants because they didn't know any better. So I got away with it. Um, <laughs> and, and so we, we, we hid it in those days. But now we proudly wear the badge. So, um, we're, I mean, it's, it's much easier to do those things now than it was that the shareholders I had at the cinema club um, continue to this day not to get it. But they're seeing healthy dividends, so they don't shout so loudly. Mm. Um, and at Rose, I've just got one investor, and, and he actually pushes me to do more than I do myself. Right. Yeah, he, D Divine's investors are all mission-driven investors, mm -hmm. so they want us to be doing what we're doing. They want it to be effective. They want us to prove the case. So, I mean, that's the reason they're in, for, in it. Okay, well, look, I'm going to throw... Thank you very much for that, um, everybody. Um, I'm going to throw this open... It's okay. Um, I'm going to throw this open to um, the audience, and, and particularly, you know, we've got lots of um, small, smaller businesses, start-up businesses here who... Um, might want to do this but are facing difficulties. Who would like to go first? And I think there are roving mics around as well. I've got one here. Uh, hello, uh, Martin Hawley from uh, Board Circle. It, it feels to me there's a failure to see how everything's connected within business and that to make uh, good business good business is really a question of good governance and actually businesses having the headspace to uh, behave as the leaders we've heard from this morning are, are behaving and thinking. And uh, do you agree with that? That's my question. Christoph. Sorry, being foreign, can you repeat but that? To, just having, um, uh, good to, me, to me a lot is about good governance and have businesses having the headspace to think about more than just the profit side, but actually think about what the business is for and what, what, how it fits within society. I mean, again, I've found with big corporations I work with, that's very hard. Again, I can sort of do the same game what you do. I say this is sort of, this has to go, you, you do good, but it goes under the marketing or PR budget, and then you can sort of say it. But I think, again, the, with what Mary was saying, to, to accept that it's not just value, but values, I still find it very hard to accept. I still sort of have to sort of shove it under a different column. Um, it would be nice if that wouldn't be the case, but uh, currently... In chocolate, it's Sorry. been very interesting over the last five years because you've seen all of the big corporations make significant moves into fair trade and invest significantly in working with farmers in West Africa. And they're doing that because there is no sustainability in cocoa, and it's literal, i.e. they're running out of cocoa. There isn't enough cocoa for the amount of chocolate that could conceivably be consumed, and if they don't secure it, then it completely messes up their business model because you can't, you know, the whole point is a Mars a day helps you work Western play. If you only have it for Christmas and Easter, the business model doesn't work. So they need to create that sustainability. So I think it's interesting what drives businesses to behave more sustainable is, is often it's a very obvious thing where the thing you're doing need, need, needs to be addressed in a different way because it's not possible to carry on doing it in the way you used to do it. But I would actually say it, it, there has to be a big change in consumer behaviour because consumers do need to put their values first as well and so that it's not good enough for people to now and again buy something that actually is sustainable they need to every single goods good and service you buy makes the way the world it is today it makes it good or it makes it bad and unless consumers do something about that it's actually doesn't really matter what the governance of a company is it won't work and so consumers are going to have to come on this journey with us. I mean, I, the, the only thing I, I would add to that, I mean, I think there is a thing around, there are corporate governance issues where 
if consumers are to respond in the way that one would want, then they need to be able to see what's yeah. happening in a business. So you need accountability. And so there needs to be, you know, and the things I think you can do around transparency and reco reporting requirements. But I think the other problem we've got is just the way the financial uh, services sector, the banking sector in particular, operates because the fund managers and others uh, are very demanding of shareholders as people who run businesses will know and are constantly looking at your management accounts every six months and asking why you're not delivering a certain return. Whereas trying to get companies thinking in a more long-term way, I think that the way our financial services sector operates stands an obstacle. The amount of chairs and CEOs, and obviously I'm talking about the larger companies here, who complain to me about that huge pressure from investors constantly when they're doing their investor relations and the roadshows. Uh, the problems that creates is um, an issue. Hey, but what about from the point of view of a small business, the answer to that question? Um, well, the governance um, process that um, you're suggesting might be antithetical to responsibility. Uh, if your management team in an SME buys your vision, buys your values, it's not just you as the owner or the boss or the CEO saying, this is what I want, go out and do it. Um, the the more, much more effective model is to sell it to your team. Because they're the ones who are going to send it to your customers. You're not going to go and talk to all your customers. They will. Um, so the balanced scorecard that our management uh, meetings are held by include not just sales targets, profit targets, and um, uh, staff retention, but also social impact. You know, what are we doing with our local schools? Um, how many um, interns have we taken? How many apprentices have we taken on? Those are all things in which management confidence is uh, uh, reviewed by. So it, it is intrinsic to the whole process. So doesn't become antithetical, it becomes core to the governance procedure that um, a principle uh, of more than old-fashioned profitability and shareholder return um, is maintained within the, uh, the company. And it does lead, just like B corporations do in America, to much greater staff loyalty. And, and, and as I was saying earlier, people do want to do business with uh, others that share the same values as them. Okay, and I'll take some more questions. If you could just raise your hands. Uh, we've got one here. <coughs> Hi, I'm John Elskud. I'm a business connector. Um, my host company is Natural National Grid, but I'm connecting in Birmingham. Um, so thinking through the points you're just making then around um, uh, the, the free trade uh, movement and how that's that's grown, and actually now there's, there's um, the majority of chocolate organisations are doing that. Made me think a little bit about sort of the free range egg, free you know battery hen sort of thing, and using that as a metaphor. Um, so it, you know, I, I will always go and buy free range eggs for example and I'm happy to pay the extra 50 60 pence or whatever that may be because I a happy egg is a, a tastier egg um, how would you drive consumers though that are absolutely driving their decisions based on financials to make the responsible choice rather than necessarily the choice that is uh, is down to finance so it's, it's almost how do you get um, the consumer to make the responsible buying choice Sophie well, I think, they, uh, I, I think there's ways that governments can work to do incentives. So if you had actual true cost accounting of products, which if you think you buy things that are unsustainable, they, they, they show themselves, in or they reveal themselves in different places. So if people continue to eat ready meals that are full of uh, things that are bad for you, then actually that reveals itself in the public health budget and so that sort of sense of can you use taxation in a positive way to make things that are worse for you more expensive I think would be quite an interesting thing to look at from a from a, a, a consumer eating products perspective but I think you've also got to see yourself uh, you've, got, you've got to perhaps start to see yourself in 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 the whole world and so that that idea that if you've got a, a job that pays you very little and you're needing to do two jobs in order to make ends meet and therefore you shop in Primark which creates more jobs for people that then can't make ends meet you know how do you get people to break that cycle uh, you know I, th I think we need to have you know more co more conversations about it actually I think we also need to think about the culture that we're creating where the uh, the entrepreneurial culture is dominated by things like Apprentice and Dragon's Den, where you're perceiving business as sort of nasty and competitive, and actually seeing it as the, as, as the means to make the world the way you'd like it to be, and to create the jobs that you'd like your children and your brothers and sisters to do, I think it would be, a really, it would be really nice to change that culture, to shift that culture, and say we expect something different from British businesses, we expect them to treat people properly. We expect people to feel rewarded, rewarded properly, but also as if they've got something, to, uh, that, that, that their role is important. 
So I think I think culture change would probably be quite important. Okay, I'm going to try and just get two more in before we close the session. Um, uh, can I take another question, Pre preferably from a woman, please? I don't want to just only go for men. There we are. Thank you. Hi, I'm. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm Zoe Robinson. Um, I run the Good Wardrobe, which is an online sustainable fashion hub. I've worked with Divine, and Chicka is my MP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they didn't pay me to sit out. at the front. <laughs> ask this question. Um, Mary talked earlier on about, um, she mentioned Rana Plaza at the factory collapse. Um, and I'm involved in uh, Fashion Revolution Day, which is happening on the 24th of April. Um, my question is primarily to Chicka and Sophie. Um, how. Sophie, you've mentioned the, the consumer voting with their wallet and how they can be empowered. But how do we find the balance between empowering the consumer and the legislation? Do you and your um, colleagues, Chukka, kind of need to, I don't know that much about politics, but do they need to take, do they need to see the consumer making change and being empowered before, they, before the legislation happens? How can um, those involved in Fashion Revolution Day um, kind of make that change and begin to get the message across to both um, Parliament and to consumers. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that. So you might answer first then if it makes sense to you. Then yeah, I'll what I would what say is... <laughs> 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 um, what I would say, I think the... Uh, I'll say two or three things. I think the first thing is, um, one of the worst characteristics of politicians is that what are the two things that you can do? You can spend public money or you can create laws. And uh, sometimes it's best not to do either of those things to start off with. Um, and I would rather, in the first instance, seek to incentivize businesses to do the right thing and to provide information, et cetera, for consumers to make an informed and responsible choice, so to speak, than immediately rushing to regulate the hell out of all these, you know, all the entrepreneurs and small businesses in this room. Um, because, you know, we have to get a balance between trying to achieve goals, but also not chaining you with um, you know, red tape and, 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 and burdensome rules when we're at the same time asking you to help provide jobs. I think, you know, small, small and micro businesses are providing two thirds of private sector jobs in this country. So that's the first thing. But secondly, what we can do, I think certainly in respect of um, larger businesses, is require them to actually disclose what they're doing so that you can make that informed choice. Um, I, I just give you one example. I think one of the most outrageous things that is happening in our country at the moment is that small companies and entrepreneurs like people in this room are effectively bankrolling large companies, their customers, who refuse to pay them on time. Uh, which is ridiculous given the large customers can access finance and all the rest of it to manage their cash flow in a way that smaller businesses can't. Now, we've tried actually to legislate and regulate to sort that problem out, but it hasn't always worked because it would require you using that legislation, which means having a row with your customer, which you don't want. But actually, if we expose, name and shame the people who are the worst offenders in that respect and give other people the tools to act on your behalf to make sure they pay you on time, then that will actually help achieve the goal that we want. So I suppose I just use that as an example of how we can intelligently use the tools at our disposal to help you and help consumers make that informed choice. Yeah, I would. I mean, so I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to go back on what I said on corporate accountability and governance. Is I, I so think. So you turn. Yeah, I'm. I'm you turning right sitting here. <laughs> is is no. I think the idea of companies disclosing proportional and relevant information so that consumers can make informed choices. Uh, I think one of the things you need to remember culturally is that historically companies didn't do audited accounts and now it's unthinkable that you don't have audited accounts and so that on a financial basis we now have something we can measure things by and when people say well how's divine going they expect me to say what's the turnover what's the profitability they don't expect me to start talking about a woman in a village in Ghana and how she's now got her own enterprise that's not what they expect as the answer that's not how success is measured and so that idea of uh, I think we we live in an age where there's so much information that most of us just zone out it's just white noise and so we actually need to work out what information would be useful information for normal consumers to have access to and what information would we like people who are looking on our behalf at to get to see. And I think those two sorts of information are not the same. And so we want people like, say, Oxfam to be able to look at detailed information that is disclosed by uh, big corporations. But we also need some information that we can look at for ourselves. And so it would be interesting to think what would those pieces of disclosure be? Because could you say your average creditor date? Mm. I think that would be very 
interesting, particularly to small and medium-sized enterprises. But could you also say the ratio of the, differ the differential between the top pay and the bottom pay in your business? Because inequality doesn't make better, more sustainable societies. So would that be one of the things that you might pick? Would you say the amount of people who have died in service if you're running... I mean, you know, what things do you disclose? What would meaningfully make you make a decision about which company you'd like to buy products from? And can we have a small enough of them that they are uh, visible, uh, understandable, but also proportionate to the op operation of the company? One of the things that's difficult for me as a small company is that we've just turned over now since we started £100 million pounds and we've invested two million in what we call producer support and development. So, so that's in addition to the fair trade price and premium. That is 61% of our profits we have invested in working with the farmers that own us and work with us. That's not the distribution of profit, that's the way our business is modelled. So when you look at what it is that Nestle say is saying it's doing within its uh, sustainability programme, is it proportionate to their turnover and their reach and their profit. And I think that's the thing that's quite difficult for an average person to see when you look at information coming out of big corporations. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you um, very much. I've been signalled to by the generals at the back that um, I'm to wrap up um, this session because we're going to be moving to the round tables yet. So I think um, all that remains for me to do is to thank our panellists and hand back over to Stephen. Thank you. Well, and let me add my thanks to uh, a stimulating conversation, an important conversation, both what we heard before and after. You'll be happy to know we're about to move to lunch, so we'll keep our priorities straight. But just a, a couple of things that I heard and see if you heard them the same way. We talked about the challenge of long-term value creation and the importance of bringing your customers along with you. We talked about creating value for your business by living your values, but also how do you communicate that? How do you share that? And this is true for big businesses and small. How do you get those communication messages out there in a real and authentic way? And how do we help investors uh, and customers use those data points to make informed decisions, not just to listen to the bump and the greenwash? We, we talked a lot about culture this morning, the culture that comes from what you do, not what you say, of course, and what we talk about internally within business and the community quite a bit, is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. The culture will dominate the behaviors, not what you put on the wall and what you say. We talked about the purpose of business being more than just profit generation and shareholder value creation. Those are important components, of course. But if that's your priority, if you're serving yourself before you're serving your customers, it's not going to last very long. And you're going to get caught out in all of that, particularly as you go through the cycle. Um, we heard a little bit about how you all as entrepreneurs need to be sure you're spending time on your business and not just in your business. You can get so busy being busy that you begin to forget why you're here in the first place and the things that you're trying to achieve both as an organization and as individuals. And as we were talking about in our session this morning a little bit, what I'm seeing, and maybe this just comes with age, I don't know, but this idea of personal and business fulfillment comes from focusing on what you want to be rather than what you want to get and those take you to slightly different places, um, but hopefully a successful thing in the end. We're here to help and support. We will be sending you some information, sorry to fill your inboxes, with some ideas, some tools, some things that we hope will help you grow your businesses, create job opportunities, fulfill the vision that you have for your own businesses in a sustainable and responsible way. Because responsible businesses, we've heard the experts, the people who are living it on the sharp end say, is a good business. And, and I guess the final word on this that I would say, we talk, I live in London, just moved house, uh, everybody's thinking about property prices. And we talked a little bit this morning about share prices. And I go back to this idea of what is success? How do we measure the success of this community around here, my community? And to me, we don't measure it in house prices. We don't measure it in share prices. We measure it in the character of the people that live there, the men and women, like the ones in this room who, who work hard and dream big, who serve their communities who love their families, who give other people opportunities. That's what creates the success model. By the way, economic prosperity will flow out of that if that's what we're trying to be, not what we're trying to get. Thank you. I hope this was valuable for you. It was sure valuable for me and fun. Thank you again to our speakers. Uh, and we'll continue our conversation over uh, Waitrose lunch in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you.